Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, so today I want to take a uh, opportunity to talk about how we're treating the data that's being collected by all the sensors that we're working with for AR and these other applications. Oh. Um. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm a co-founder and CTO of Phantasma. Uh, Phantasma, we're building uh, decentralized 3D maps for robots and augmented reality. Uh, so to us, interoperability of data is very important, and we see this as uh, how we facilitate these different spatial applications that are reliant on the underlying data sets. Um, so uh, for world-scale augmented reality, uh, we need to answer two questions uh, for it to feel like a good experience. Uh, the first is where am I? So this is precise localization within your environment, both position and orientation. And then once you know where you're at, you can then ask the question, well, what is around me? Where are the walls? Where are the doors? Where are the chairs? Where's Pikachu? Um, but the second question is not relevant until we know the first, because it's nonsensical to ask what's around me if I have no idea where I am. And this is really the stage uh, that we're starting to enter now um, uh, in, the, in the AR industry when we're talking about world-scale data. Uh, and there's a number of uh, companies and academics who are working on this very problem of how do we localize sensors uh, with high fidelity in a variety of different environments. Um, so there's a number of different positioning solutions, of course. Um, GPS, RF Magnetic have uh, been in use for some time in, in various ways and capacities. Um, none of these solutions uh, provide the accuracy that's needed uh, for these applications that are emerging in AR and, and other spatial areas. Um, so we have to move to the camera uh, in a general sense of optical cameras, depth sensors, uh, and other sensors that allow us to uh, visually assess the environment. And this is the way that we can really get that last centimeter of positioning. Uh, so for camera positioning, the, the input is a variety uh, of different types from different, different sensors, uh, 2D images, RGBD images, as well as 3D point clouds. Um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do uh, with all these different inputs is determine our six degree of freedom pose. So this is our position and orientation within the space. Um, so this is a very overgeneralized um, version of how camera positioning works. Of course, there are many, many uh, different ways that you can perform uh, camera-based positioning, uh, but very generally, uh, you're normally going to first look for distinct visual features. Now, these can be um, a number of different things. Uh, certainly in the literature, there's a number of classical feature descriptors, but um, even at this conference, we've seen people doing things with mid-level geometry, looking at lines and models and other things, so there's higher level features we can talk about as well. Uh, but there's always a step where we're going to assess the input in some variety to pull distinct features out of it. We're gonna try to compare those features against the map. Uh, this can be done through a number of different search algorithms. Uh, there's work to do this uh, through deep learning methods as well. Um, but once we have these features, we need to then figure out what they represent inside of the base map that we already have for that space. And then finally, once we're able to uh, figure out uh, what our matches are, we can uh, compute our pose from that. Um, so in this imagery here, we just show how we're taking uh, just normal classic CV features from an image. We're comparing that back to a visual map, and from that, we're, to, we're able to assess the frustum uh, of this position. Uh, so this is something we're actively working on at Phantasmo, is once we're able to capture 3D maps, is to then accurately localize off of them using this imagery and just working with uh, mobile devices. Um, AR is not the only industry that needs this, though, of course. Uh, we talk about AR cloud and, and this, this infrastructure layer that we're building to support these applications, but it's not just AR. It's every spatial application that's going to need this data. Thomas Robotics, indoor navigation, emergency response, all of these industries are impacted by this data set and fundamentally require it. Uh, but the constraint is that we need the maps. So unlike something like uh, GPS or um, 
RF or these other signal-based positioning methods that require infrastructure in the environment. For visual positioning, we need a map to position off of. Um, and this is whether you're any one of these platforms, we're all working with cameras, we're all working with depth sensors. We all have the same underlying uh, data set that we can work and position off of. So the question is, why not share the maps? Um, if we're going to be trying to facilitate this, this infrastructure and allow these different applications to all play in the same space, how do I get a mobile device to operate in the same environment as a robot, to operate in the same environment as an IoT sensor? Um, it's not by going and remapping the same space every single time for each different application in vertical, it's by sharing this map data across. Um, so when we work with open data, we get a number of wonderful benefits. Uh, we get this network effect of sensors. Uh, so regardless of um, what's in this space, they can all share data uh, with each other, which improves coverage of, of our maps. It also leads to faster uh, update rates because of course real environments, especially 3D environments and indoor environments like where we sit right now, uh, change with extremely high frequency. So like where these chairs are on the stage, what the state of the, uh, the doors are, these things change all the time. And so we need a fast update rate and en enough sensors feeding into this model that we can uh, accurately reflect what the state of an environment really is. Uh, when this data is available, this of course leads to faster development um, and lower barriers of entry. So when you have uh, applications that are uh, coming about and developers and startups and these different um, uh, projects that are going on, if the data is already there, uh, that's one less thing they have to do because uh, you shouldn't have to have a core competency in mapping and localization just to start building a spatial application, but that's really where we're at right now. So when we do closed data, um, which is uh, similar to what Google is trying to propose right now with their VPS, uh, we get things like walled gardens where uh, it might work out fine if you're in the ecosystem and they're still supporting it, but as soon as Google decides VPS isn't in their wheelhouse anymore, uh, that might become problematic for you. Uh, it has incomplete coverage because it's only gonna exist where that system has mapped. Uh, it's gonna have a slow update rate because you don't have these, uh, the data from these other ecosystems feeding in, um, which results in duplicated work of us mapping spaces over and over and over again, and of course, higher barriers of entry. So our proposal uh, is to do a camera positioning standard. And this is meant as a way to provide interoperability between these different applications. And this isn't about prescribing how we need to use the data. This is about storing and sharing the data in consistent ways that all these applications are able to use them. So how this works is it is a suite of machine readable data formats uh, that allow visual data to be stored in consistent and robust ways, such that we can have data coming in from an iPhone, a dash cam, a robot sensor, that all are producing these same visual features that then we can feed into maps uh, that create canonical representations of a space that any application can then leverage. So, so with this, um, what, what we're trying to propose is a set of principles that a standard like this would follow that would uh, allow it to become uh, the resource needed for these different applications. So uh, inspired by the work done uh, by the GRPC protocol, uh, who published a set of principles around what the standard should subscribe to and how it should be developed, same we also uh, are doing that for CPS. So, a small section of these principles include uh, being free and open, so allowing these features uh, and the different pieces of the framework to be completely free and open source, uh, so that there's no license, licensing or issues uh, impeding development and uh, adopting the standard. Uh, interoperability, we want this to be platform agnostic, of course. Um, at Phantasma, we're working with mobile devices all the way up to LIDARs, and we care about taking the data from all those and building those into the same maps and utilizing those same maps across these different uh, hardware platforms. Uh, so we want to be platform agnostic and easily consumable by any platform. 
Uh, it should be general purpose such that it's uh, applicable to a broad set of use cases. So it is every, everything that I listed in the earlier slide of all the different verticals that need this data set, it should be applicable to them. Um, and finally, uh, coverage and simplicity. So the, the framework should be available on every popular computer vision platform, uh, such as mobile devices, compatible with things like ROS and OpenCV, um, and easily extensible to new ones, because of course we are rapidly iterating right now, uh, both uh, on the industry and academic side, and there's no way that we can fully encompass um, all the use cases and platforms that are going to exist in the future. So this needs to be designed in an extensible way uh, so that it can be brought to all those future platforms, even those that are limited in CPU and memory. So at Phantasmo, uh, we are actively uh, pushing for this um, and, and putting our code uh, to use as well. Um, we, we're not interested in, um, you know, talking about this, starting, you know, starting some working group and going for four years before we start to move. We're, we're actually building these things right now and we're going to be opening up parts of this and we really wanna get the community involved and get the input on this of how we can improve and make it applicable to all the use cases that we imagine it being used. So um, how that's manifesting over the summer, um, is today, uh, we've just published a blog post uh, on our Medium channel uh, about the motivations and principles of this standard. Um, in July, we are going to be releasing the first uh, C++ reference implementation uh, for this work that will allow you to immediately begin building these maps yourself. Uh, and finally, we're gonna follow that up uh, later in the summer with a formal proposal for the, uh, the first specification in the draft. And I guess, uh, you know, I just want to reiterate that while um, the data formats that we're working with now um, are, are one uh, manifestation of, of this uh, type of visual data, uh, we foresee that this will become a whole suite of standards and that they don't need to all be encompassed in a single format, but rather it would be a, uh, a group of formats that would uh, work across the board on these different applications. Um, but of course, we need uh, full community support. Uh, we want to um, have this be an open and community-driven standard, and we're very interested to talk and work with everyone about their use cases, their platforms, and how this could be useful for them. Um, because we don't, we don't want everyone to be building this over and over again. We don't want everyone to have to figure out their own way to store this data and to use this data. So we should all help each other out by sharing it together. Um, so, uh, ways that uh, you can immediately get involved if you're interested. Uh, we have uh, thrown up a site at camerapositioning.io, which is where we're going to have uh, all the news and updates about this standard as it develops. Uh, we've started a Slack community and mailing list, uh, links that you can get uh, through that website. Um, through those groups, we would encourage you to um, start sharing what, what apps you're working on that really need positioning and that you wanna be feeding this data back in through that you think others might be able to leverage as well. Uh, and certainly what platforms you're working on too. So uh, if it's mobile devices, if it's robotics, if it's step sensors, uh, we wanna hear about it because that's how we're going to drive uh, the first use cases and the first adoption of this sort of format. Um, we're planning to uh, be hosting gatherings in Los Angeles, which is where uh, uh, we, Phantasma, are located in Venice Beach. Um, and we'll also be doing some digital meetups as well. So uh, those will be announced through the mailing list and through the website. Um, and we encourage you to, to join on those if you're interested. And um, we're gonna need developers that wanna help uh, hack on this stuff and wanna help build maps and help build data formats. Um, and so we're gonna be releasing uh, the code that we've built thus far for our, for our internal format uh, onto a GitHub that uh, everyone can start accessing, and that will be coming up in the next month or so. And uh, at that time, we would encourage you to jump in and check out the code and see if it works for you and makes sense. And uh, you know, let's talk about it and give us some feedback on how uh, we can make it work for you too. Um, so that's, uh, that's it, if you want, if you want to uh, catch up. Uh, definitely visit camerapositioning.io about this standard specifically. Uh, you can find me and my company at phantasmo.io, and you can uh, contact me personally at ryan at phantasmo. 
Um, so thank you very much for your time. Well, so that's, I guess, uh, up for you to decide of how you want to use. So this is really just a data format and a messaging protocol. So much like, um, like ROS or these, these other uh, types of standards and formats that we use in embedded systems, um, you can create these maps and you can store it locally. You could create these maps and share it. Um, certainly at Phantasma, that's an interest of ours is helping to facilitate the exchange of these maps and keeping the data open and free. Um, public, for public data, we think that uh, this is going to drive to zero. We have uh, no less than 50 companies that are mapping streets in San Francisco right now. That's kind of silly, right? Like if we can share that data, then everyone can leverage off of that. Um, but for indoor data, um, we, there's a uh, privacy and security aspect uh, to that, and how that data is used will impact that space owner and the applications that exist in that space. So I think that's going to come down to the developers and, and the exact use case of the data, but uh, we would encourage you to, even if, you, even if you're not playing to share the maps, that uh, just you using it internally for projects could still help to further the advancement of it. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Do you have any tips outdoor for escaping light and weather conditions? So, Phantasma uh, does have a, a localization pipeline that, we're, that we've been testing and we're getting ready to release as well that works off of these map formats. Um, the, that piece itself is not a, uh, necessarily prescribed to be the usage of this data format because you could use, this is just the, the data layer that then you could build your own localization solution on. So we foresee that even other companies that have competing localization solutions could still work off of similar maps because it's the same input data. Can you describe what your hosting services are? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, so the question is, what does Phantasma's hosting service look like? Um, so we are pushing for an open first party data model. So all of our um, hosting platform is open source and containerized. So um, if you want to run it on premise, if you want to run it in your own cloud, uh, that is totally up to you. So maybe that gives you some more color around uh, how this map data can be handled and stored. It's not about, um, if you produce these maps, it's not about us trying to say like, okay, give us all this data and then we'll monetize off of it. We want to help everybody else produce these maps so that they can leverage them in a way that befits their application and use case. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for everything you've done. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, and when you guys are making this camera positioning um, standard, um, what decisions have you made? Like, have you used, uh, like Unity, for example, uses one meter as a standard of, uh, of measurement, right? Uh, yeah. Sure. So the question is, what uh, decisions have we already uh, started to make in the design process of our data formats? Um, we have made a lot of small decisions like that that we've already started to think around. Um, how, do, how are we representing this data? What are the coordinate systems? Um, personally, so we're, we're pushing for uh, local reference frames within the data itself with an, external, uh, with an external reference for the entire file. So this way, within the file, we're not concerned with like storing long GPS or ECF strings. We can just have it all local to the origin and then have an external reference for the, the file itself. Um, the coordinates to be in meters um, and the, um, uh, the refer or, sorry, the coordinate system to be right-handed uh, Y down, which is the same as the OpenCV standard, because this is, I'm sure everyone in this room has run into this issue of, um, you know, not having things in the right coordinate system and that uh, wasting about two days, you know, trying to debug that problem. <laughs> yeah.